Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Idol Podcast, the podcast where I do a weekly book review. This week, I read Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. This is the cover for my visual people. Um, this is a nonfiction book that was released in 2017 by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is an astrophysicist for people who aren't aware. This book includes a few essays from Tyson that were written originally for the Natural History magazine, which Tyson wrote for from 95 to 05, but this is also his field of, you know, his profession, so um, he's pretty educated on this topic, so it's very fitting that he would be the one to give us this masterpiece. Now this is a pretty straightforward structure. Um, as you would expect probably from a scientist it's not very artistically done it's just there's a preface there's a few chapters and those chapters are broken down um, into topical segments so that's pretty much it just basic book Um, and it is only about 200 pages it's pretty small I don't know if you could tell by me holding it up but this is like a pretty small book compared to others Um, and the font isn't too too big either so or too small um so this is i would say under normal circumstances this would be a pretty quick read but because of the topic at hand you might want to take your time a little bit on this one now being that this is a book that is written by an astrophysicist i think it's fitting that we discuss the writing style just because this isn't someone who would normally write a book for the general audience, um, like people like us. And he's pretty familiar with, you know, obviously publishing works um, and different research, but it's important that we analyze the way that he connects with the general public or people that are in a hurry and would like to learn about astrophysics. So. The first thing I noticed pretty early on is that he uses repetition. And this is used in, um, as we take a look at the Big Bang Theory and what happened immediately after that, and then after that, and then after that. So it's a pretty succinct timeline. But after every event that is explained or every significant event, he'll say, okay, so a trillionth of a second has passed. Then he'll go on to explain something else. Okay, a millionth of a second has passed. Another event, a minute has passed. What this does for us is it gives us context. It really enforces how quickly these events are happening in this very, very small point of time. And these events, it's taken like pages for him to explain it to us. And this is happening all within one trillionth of a second, which is crazy when you think about it because to you and I one second seems very short and it's like what could really happen in a second you know let alone what could happen in one trillionth of a second so I do like that he started that right off the bat to just get us focused and recognizing the importance of time in this specific instance now being that this is a book on astrophysics there is a lot of formal terminology so these are things like probably terms that you've heard before probably in high school science or chemistry whatever um, such as like protons neutrons atoms things like that but then we also have new words like cyanogen or deuterium there and there's so many more that i didn't want to write down because i didn't want to pronounce them but he uses these terms obviously accurately but he's using them as you know an astro astrophysicist would if he's writing an essay or um, I guess presenting research and so although we're not given explanations of each term after he uses it it is being used correctly and as the audience we are tasked with inferring you know if we really want to know what the word is we can look it up but to infer where this word falls into the story or into the timeline you just have to kind of put together 
the, the whole paragraph or the whole chapter of information. And so at first I was a little annoyed because if you've seen previous episodes, if I come across in fiction or nonfiction, if I come across a word that I don't know or that I'm skeptical about, like I, I just, I'm not entirely sure I know what it means, I'll just go look it up in my dictionary app. Super easy, it takes me like three seconds, get the definition. Um, if I need further clarification, I'll like look for sentences or examples and that way I'm able to, okay, I'm able to understand what this author is trying to say. With this, if I did that for every word I did not know, I would not be finished this book until like August. So take that as you may, but there are a lot of terms that are obviously used in this field and it's important for those words to be used correctly so you know kind of where they fall into place. Now, even though this is a lot of formal, semi-intimidating words, we do get almost like an informal presentation. By that, I mean it's kind of really lax. Um, he does use like, I guess, basic words to even it out. So things like using the word universal. So we understand, you know, the basic meaning of universal or saying constant. So there's a constant source of energy, something like that. Or my favorite, um, he was describing a specific particle. He said these are super duper high charged particles. So obviously we know what that means. And so with us being able to have these words to kind of balance the, the heavier stuff off of, it really does, you know, lighten the mood a little bit. And he also, you know, there's metaphors, things like that. Um, one particular quote I really like is that he said, galaxies decorate the dark voids of space like cities across a country at night. This helps me be able to visualize what galaxies might look like if you have a really, really large lens and you're just kind of overseeing the entire universe, what galaxies might look like. Because I can visualize, for example, the US and all of the all of the electricity that we use um, in just the different cities at night, being able to recognize that where there is a concentrated source of energy or electricity, that's probably New York City <laughs> or, um, you know, just any other cities across the US. And so being able to translate that into galaxies was definitely really helpful. And he does that a few times actually. So even though I may not recognize what some of those formal terms are, I'm able to see, okay, this is how the galaxies are somewhat situated on a much, much larger scale. And then we also have the tone. So if you've ever seen any of Neil deGrasse Tyson's interviews or podcasts or shows or anything like that, he does have um, a specific sense of humor. Um, and it's funny because he's very into, you know, his work and his research and explaining, he's very open to explaining, you know, the universe, but he is kind of funny. And so even him, we're discussing in one of these chapters, a Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. Now, what happened with this specific galaxy is that it was essentially eaten by the Milky Way or absorbed. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, um, but he said later on in the paragraph that we probably should have named this specific galaxy lunch because the Milky Way ate it, you know, hilarious. <laughs> you'll appreciate that though. As you get through this book, you'll appreciate those little, um, you know, side dad jokes, I guess. It's really just a down to earth tone and it helps a lot because again, Astrophysics can be kind of intimidating. Um, you know, everyone didn't necessarily enjoy sciences. And this is like the basic sciences in school, let alone uh, the people who just have no clue at all. So it's, it's nice to have kind of some type of personality in there as you lay. All right, and so the last few things on writing style I have are a couple of quotes that are right before chapter one. So the first one is by Tyson himself, and it says, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. 
if you are going to read this book, I want you to remember that quote, okay? The universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. Just remember that. And then secondly, um, this quote is from Lucretius. The world has persisted many a long year, having once been set going in the appropriate motions. From these, everything else follows. What these two quotes do is they set the tone for the book and they set the expectations for the reader. Recognize one thing. The universe is something that we are discovering on an ongoing basis. There are scholars out there, there are people out there who have studied specific topics their entire life within the universe and they still are trying to figure certain things out. That being said, you will not ever, I want to say, really get all of the answers on the universe. So if you think that this book is going to give you that, you are wrong. Um, even, even though this is this isn't even like the whole story. This is a very condensed version of events. It's in under 200 pages. There's no way this is the full, you know, rundown on the universe. Again, this is astrophysics for people in a hurry. So I want all, anyone listening to this, anyone thinking of reading this book, to just keep those two quotes in mind before you read it so that your expectations aren't too, too high, okay? This is not um, the equivalent to a Harvard degree in astrophysics at all, just so we're all aware here. And lastly, just like the, the topic of referencing. So obviously, um, like I said, some of the essays from his entries in the Natural History magazine made its way into this book, but also him acknowledging that the compounding works of the people that came before him are really what led to this point. So what I mean by that is there are laws that have been established, de-established, uh, redefined, um, you know, like laws of physics, all this other stuff, things that maybe in the 1700s, they knew for a fact that something, something about physics was, you know, concrete. Whereas we find out a hundred years later, there was more information to that and they were actually wrong. There are so many different uh, studies and research that has gone into creating uh, this this education on astrophysics and ultimately this book and so i like that he kind of anytime he's referencing a specific theory or something like that he'll uh, mention the person that inspired it or maybe their work inspired it or who came up with it who actively pursued to find the answers for this um so people like that we already know isaac newton albert einstein but then also people like george gamel or fritz zwicky sometimes professors, you know, sometimes people that weren't necessarily even looking into whatever it is that they proved right. So understanding that there's so much information that has come together for us to be able to even verify one thing, you know, it's almost like a foundation. People centuries ago found out the basics for us. Then we Put some more information on top of that then we get some more technology advancement so we're able to further verify or or further deconstruct a specific law that we might have thought was was real and so it's important for us to credit the amount of time and effort that has gone into this and it's not just tyson himself you know He's just one of many and one of the more recent ones that have added on to this. So I just, I liked how with every passing um, explanation, we were able to get a reference of who may have worked on it prior to. And it's, it's almost like we're combining multiple laws and theories to just verify one thing. So he'll go on like maybe a two or three page um, explanation just to get to one point you know it's it's just crazy how science works how it takes so much just for us to figure out one thing and then years later you're like duh of course gravity exists but you don't know like all of the stuff that went in to figuring this out so 
just appreciate, you know, all of the science scientists that came before us. All right, so now that we're done with writing style, um, a couple of themes that I found that were prevalent in this, which it sounds kind of weird talking about themes when we're speaking on astrophysics, but I found a couple. So time obviously is one. So again, we're being told this story of how the universe started on a chronological timeline. Time is really a relatable concept because again, even though we may not be able to comprehend um, millions of years of the universe forming and all that stuff, at least we're able to say, okay, this is the start, this is the end, where are we at in between? What's happening at what stage? And so Tyson reinforcing earlier on, um, all of this happened in one millionth of a second or something like that, that's very important. And it's easier for us to kind of grasp that concept. Then we also get time defining distance. And I don't know if that's the, the right way to say it, but for example, instead of saying that this is X miles away, we'll say that this, this specific planet or this galaxy is however many light years away. And we've all heard the term uh, light years before, and we know that it takes a really, really long time. And light years is not a regular Earth year, but being able to hear, okay, it's 500 million light years away. Like, wow, that's, that's super far because that's how far, you know, light would travel and all that good stuff. Um, but again, this, this whole idea is of time being one of the things that we can understand and that's able to convey, you know, more information to us. And when I talk about time, I'm really thinking of like Instellar. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie, but it's super, super cool. And just thinking about how they had this scene with the Tesseract and I could not understand the Tesseract and like time was all over the place for them. And so being able to be given information and it's like a chronological timeline, I'm able to, you know, bookmark that in my head better than whatever it was they were talking about in that movie. So that was a sidebar, but. And lastly, discovery is certainly like the main theme of this book. And it's really the process of uncovering exceptions to known rules. So again, breaking down what we may have thought was correct and what was concrete and not just like actively trying to tear down other people's research but just using as much information as you have available to you to either prove or disprove or find something else to prove whatever it is we're discovering new stuff it seems almost daily i don't know what they do in those laboratories and stuff but there's so much new stuff coming out about space and the universe so i think discovery is probably the most consistent theme of history in general um there's always when we're talking about space there's always going to be an unknown and that unknown presents opportunity and i think that's ultimately what drives a lot of these scientists recognizing that one we know a fraction of what is happening out in the universe and so that other portion of it I think drives a lot of people because it's, you know it's curiosity it's like what's going on out there and how can I prove that it's happening and I even found myself thinking oh this would be such a cool job to have but getting through that undergrad mm, I don't know if I would be able to get through an undergrad program of astrophysics be a cool job to have but I wouldn't be able to get that degree so hats off and again the findings that we have from these discoveries will ultimately add on to the knowledge that has been culminating over centuries so before we get into my review I want to get into some of the um, reception that this book has gotten which is mainly just two things critiques and praises so the intended audience is literally in the title for people that want to learn about astrophysics in a hurry, but I would even take it a step further to say that these are the people that are interested in this specific subject, but not the degree, okay? So they don't want to take an intro to astrophysics. They don't want to learn all of the specific terminology. They just want to know overall what happened. 
a lot of the critiques I saw just going online, mainly people saying they cannot understand astrophysics, which again, I told you guys that that quote, it's not all going to become clear after this book, that's for sure. Okay, you're not going to get all of the answers from the universe out of this book. This is really just a very short story of how it all happened. Um, there's a lot of terms you're not gonna understand, <laughs> but you can infer most of them. But I mean, I don't know what these people were expecting. And it wasn't a lot and it wasn't necessarily bad reviews, but it was just people complaining that they, they just couldn't understand it after finishing the book. So I really don't know what everyone's expecting, but please don't expect to know like astrophysics on a, master level you know that's not gonna happen i thought that was quite obvious but just to give you know forewarning and then the praise was mostly for again the tone that um tyson had his humor you know shining through and then his ability to fit that whole you know story of the universe into 200 pages my review so i would say that my comprehension of the size of the universe and also the time concerning the universe is very low. That's probably the first thing I learned. And that was just after a couple pages, me recognizing that I really don't have a good grasp of like how long the universe has been around and what all has happened since then and how young, you know, Earth is. It's just crazy. It blew my mind. It really did answer my questions, but I think it created even more. I picked up this book because I, a couple of times, have went down the YouTube rabbit hole of um, just videos explaining black holes and you know the universe and things like that, and different like five minute clips from even Neil deGrasse Tyson doing interviews and another another person. I wish I could remember his name. Um, they were both on the Joe Rogan podcast, and so me just listening to those little clips really like i was like okay let me pick up this book because i'm interested in a few of these things but as much as it answered it really gave me more questions which is not a bad thing i guess it's just funny how i mean that's just the way of the world i guess there's so much out there that there's no possible way i could understand it all one specific topic which is really interesting is dark matter and dark energy this is one of the videos that I watched. Um, I watched like a little video on dark matter and I could never understand what they were talking about. And so I was excited when there was a chapter on me specifically. What I found out though is dark matter does not interact with the matter that we know and we are aware of. Dark matter contains six times more gravity than regular matter. But that's it and the chapter kind of ends with we don't know what dark matter is but we understand how it affects the world that's I kid you not that's how the chapter ends and that kind of sums up my feelings about this book I guess I really don't know what astrophysics is but I get the basic effects that it has on us and the world and that's it like I'm just not really there's too much going on I get the basics I'm good but then also it's funny because dark energy is a thing as well it's a different thing than dark matter and that's one of the things that plays a part in the continued expansion of the universe I just every time they say dark matter or dark energy I picture a black cloud of like particles or dust trying to attack me I don't know but that's what I'm picturing in my head and every time I hear it discussed for some reason I just think it's evil I don't know why it's just something that we literally don't understand we just don't know what it is so that's why it's dark matter and dark energy we just can't define it yet but to me it just seems evil I don't know but I did learn a few things one being there are at least a hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe a hundred billion galaxies in the observable universe okay let me just remind you all we're in the milky way galaxy 
there are so many more galaxies in the the universe that we have seen so far okay there's still so much more of it that we don't we haven't even touched yet that's just crazy it just blew my mind it really just it makes you feel like most of your problems are insignificant i'll tell you that dwarf galaxies contain millions of stars as opposed to uh, regular galaxies that contain billions like milky way like the one we're in and then lastly one cool thing that i liked that tyson said was that science is about measuring with something other than your eyes because your eyes are connected to your brain and your brain has preconceived notions and biases i like the way that i guess scientists think that they they need a backup you know because sometimes they're just stuff that we're not able to comprehend you know clearly there's a lot i can't comprehend from this book but our brains are limited in that way that we haven't seen everything in the universe and so it's important to rely on a lot of this uh this research that these scientists are getting um and then even other scientists and pulling it together and seeing what we can um kind of conclude from there i would say overall the title is truly accurate this really is astrophysics for people in a hurry it's not dumbed down in any way but it is concise and it's i mean it's overall enjoyable i really don't know what i read <laughs> like i have some points but this isn't the type of book where i could just i can't spoil this book for you so there take that as you will and lastly this is the last thing i'm gonna say when Tyson is discussing microwaves, he's not talking about kitchen appliances. And that took me a few pages to understand. So for everyone out there, just keep that in mind. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of AI Idol Podcast. I will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend.